It is sunny in Edmonton, so I'm hoping that it is across the province as well. I'm Susan Wu, a consultant from the Edmonton Regional Learning Consortium and also representing the Alberta Regional Professional Development Consortia. We are excited to learn from a very insightful and dynamic leader in educational assessment, Rick Wormelli for practical descriptive feedback techniques and ways to minimize copying, cheating, and plagiarizing in day three in our assessment for learning series at home. As a secondary ELA teacher myself, I know the value and power of feedback in improving student learning in both reading and writing. And after all, feedback allows students to be reflective about their progress and to make the necessary adjustments for their work to elevate themselves to the next level of understanding. This leads to growth, not to be confused with academic achievement, although you do need growth to achieve higher. However, uh, today we're going to learn about how to become better at the feedback process with students and also to set up conditions to maintain student academic integrity and accountability. Ray Quirmelli is an accomplished, experienced classroom and building educator who now writes professional articles and educational books, well-training teachers, principals, superintendents, business organizations, school boards, and parents in North America and around the world. Rick is best known for his expertise in assessment and grading, and his focus today zooms in on practical descriptive feedback. Throughout the webinar, please feel free to type in any questions in the chat box, and we will be stopping at intervals uh, to allow Rick time to address those questions. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Rick. Susan, did you talk about the May 22nd? Oh, um, not yet. I was going to do that at the end. Oh, but... sorry. Well, the slide is right up there in front of us. Oh, okay. So I'll, I'll just uh, let you know, and I'll revisit this at the end. Um, it is on May 22nd, we are fortunate enough to have Rick back for a Q&A. So what is your burning question about assessment that you've um, thought throughout the series that you really wanted to ask and didn't have time for us to answer, well, we are putting Rick Romelli in the hot seat. So you can go ahead and ask your burning question in that session. Registration is available on erlc.ca. And again, it's only for an hour on May 22nd uh, from two to three. When you register, you will be asked to fill out a survey in which you will identify your burning question. All right, Rick, thanks a lot. Even if it's just slightly simmering, a low <laughs> boil, it's all right. It, it, tepid, we'll even take that, <laughs> no worries. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and do the screen sharing. Sure. And hopefully that will come up. And uh, we'll start at the very beginning here. And so Susan, if you can give me a thumbs up, does it look like you, the whole screen is filled with the slide? Perfect. Great, all right, I'm gonna, I mean, is this, we have a lot of people in the waiting room. If you can double check on that. And I am going to minimize. Oops, sorry. All right. Uh, oh, there we go. That's what I wanted to achieve. Perfect. All right. So um, when I got into grading, I thought that grading was a way to give feedback. And then I realized very quickly, grades don't give a lot of helpful feedback. A lot of times people say, well, I do grades to get feedback how kids are doing. You would have to disaggregate quite a bit to get to the point where the grade would be actually helpful as feedback. And then I start exploring what's really the most effective thing. Is it the grade or is it the feedback I give and how that could subsequently be used, be used to revise instruction, to have the kid learn it at a higher level and I started realizing there were so many things that undermine instruction that I was doing, and there are things that were better along this, the lines of feedback that actually improved instruction. So it was the genesis for a deeper dive into feedback, particularly descriptive feedback. And if you were to read any article, watch a TED talk, read a book on feedback, you would find that they universally say there's no evaluation. There's no judgment. And percentages 
rubric numbers, letter grades are judgment. And the moment you invoke judgment, you invoke threat to ego, worry about status, self-preservation. And that gets in the way of critical error analysis, the deeper dive and thinking you know, about this without doing this, defensive walls going up. How am I? I thought I was a good kid. How am I doing in relation to others? Am I in good standing? Which gets in the way and undermines the grading we're trying to do. So this is the result of that from the past few decades. And this is just a, a beginning to, to kind of take a look at it, but it is under the umbrella of how do we do ethical, accurate assessment and grading in the classroom, let alone while students are learning at home. And what we found over and over and over, and I think we even talked about it in the very first of the three-part series, is that feedback has become paramount, way more so than grades, feedback is a way to go. In fact, Ken O'Connor and Tom Gusky and several others, myself included, Myron Dweck, Tom Shimmer, Ann Davies, Ruth Sutton, before she retired to write her wonderful books, we've all talked about this fact that descriptive feedback is more powerful, more important to the learning process than letter grades ever could, could be. So let's avail ourselves of that. Let's like live up to the promise. So you have a capacity to talk to me after today. That's this second slide where you've got the website, rickwilmot.com. You've got Twitter, you want to do that. And you've got the way to email me. So if you want to have a follow-up individual conversation of some sort, you want to set something up, please let me know. I'll be glad to get to it. And now, me, I know I am violating every PowerPoint etiquette rule in the book. But here we go. Whoa, look at all that text. Well, let me just save you a little bit of time. I'm gonna focus on this part that I just circled in green. The top part is talking about, oh, 7,827 studies, all these different things. And we kept, we controlled for a certain variable and it was descriptive feedback. Yay. Okay, now start reading where the white font is and go to the bottom. I'll give you a moment. All right, if you read all those studies, regular classroom practitioners and researchers. Now, those of you with us for the three-part series, you might remember this slide. There are like two or three, maybe four slides that are from other sessions. This is one, and you might remember us talking about the fact that assessment is vital. That means it's life-giving and it's our oxygen. You can do it in a variety of ways. It's low stakes, but high feedback. So the kids feel like I can safely wrestle with this, get the critique or the feedback and be allowed to learn at a higher level and be assessed and accredited as such down the road. Grading would get in the way of that. It is not as vital. So the summation at the bottom you see there is that you can work on the equity stuff. It's a little bit more approachable, the vitality, the legitimate, it has a great impact. And remember we talked about the fact that you really can't have good assessment without instruction. You, have good, you can't good, have good instruction without assessment. So vice versa, they're, they're reciprocal to one another. That's huge. And the last little slide from that series, you might remember this, you have formative assessment, but you have summative judgment. Formative assessment, assessment coming from a sit array, meaning to sit beside, it gets feedback, you revise in light of it, it's safe. My earlier incompetence or st stumbling first steps is not gonna be a part of my final report of competence. Got it. Summative assessment is misnamed. It really should be summative judgment because summative means post-learning. In case you weren't there for that, I just had to make sure that was clear. So summative judgment slash assessment really means this is the final declaration of your learning as of this calendar date, which is when we're calling it. And there's not gonna be any more learning after that. So it's really anti, uh, it's an anti-climax. It's not really important to what's going on. Formative assessment, with the feedback that comes with it is the vital part. Cool, we got it. So let's get into what we know about descriptive feedback. First, you have to be evidentiary. And you might remember just a few of these 
slides as we're going through it. You want to be criterion referenced, not norm referenced. I don't care how you're doing in relation to classmates. Tell me how you're doing in relation to the goal. And teachers who are evidentiary are very good at analyzing student products in light of evidence. So this example uh, in a math class, explain your mathematical thinking behind it. The child says, I bought five packages of eight. Uh, these are eight buns, hot dog buns for hot dog that they're making. So then I did math. Eight times five is 40. That's how many, that doesn't reveal a whole lot. Spell beautiful is not a test of spelling. It's a test of having memorized how a word is spelled. Spelling is done very differently. Then this idea of, I wanna see if they can provide textual excerpts to support their claims about what the author is doing in the novel. And we see here, Hiroki Sugihara writes, it is a story that proves one person can make a difference. This quote means Sugihara helped the refugees even though it put him and his family in danger. On page 171, it says, if he helped these people, would he put our family in danger? If the Nazis found out, would they, what would they do? But if he did not help these people, they could all die. On page 173, Sugihara says, okay, we're taking a look at the product and we're talking to our subject like colleagues. What is demonstrated here? Are the quotes from the book appropriate? Do they support it? Are they ample enough to support it? Are they doing transitions? What is it? What's the evaluative criteria? And what I'm trying to get across to you is you can't really do good feedback unless you have vetted the evidence for the standard with your subject like colleagues, because there'll be these wild shots in the dark. It won't be as helpful. So one of the things we talked about, you know, two sessions ago was the idea that you're very comfortable about what constitutes mastery versus proficiency. Or if you think proficient is the top, what constitutes proficiency versus mastery, which might be second versus developing versus emergent or whatever your levels might be as you get into grading. This just gives you a smile. All right. And then we talked about, hey, is it mastery? The student can match a word to its definition. That's just memorization. But what if I could point to any word in the sentence? Could you tell me it's part of speech based on the function it plays? And if we revise that sentence, would the part of speech change based on what its new function is in the sentence? Oh my, that's dexterity. That's flexible thinking as we do that. So we wanna be very committed to this. This is just a typical standard, as you see there, you know, cite the textual evidence with a strong supports analysis, so inferences drawn. But one of the questions we wanna ask each other, those are the questions that are written down below. We really talk about this, and you can do this with mathematics and science and physical education. It does not matter what you teach. Oh, wait, there's a second page of questions. We have to vet that with each other. And I think until you can speak coherently, this is a subset of this. This fits into that umbrella. Oh, this is tangentially connected. You probably can't do feedback very well. So I'm gonna ask you to get evidentiary as fast as you possibly can. And that might mean parsing out your verbs, decide, just identify fact opinion, or do they have to create, revise, and manipulate opinion? That's the standard of excellence as we do this. Students walk in with snow on the shoulders, shivering. What could classmates conclude in grade one? It's cold outside. Well, that's very vivid and concrete, but leap from that to what was this author saying about government propaganda in the classic novel, All Quiet on the Western Front? That's more abstract, more grown up. And then we sit down and really decide, all right, they have to learn this, they have to learn this, they have to learn this. What I'm doing is reminding you that this is not a skill set that's overtly taught in schools of development for teachers. And you really can't have this conversation until you're intimate with the curriculum you teach. So I'm suggesting this is an in-service, not a pre-service experience. And that there are skills, Larry Ainsworth talks about this, many others, of how do you unwrap the learner outcomes, essential outcomes, secondary outcomes, whatever they are within those larger standards. So we could say grade fours need to learn this, grade eights in this subject need to learn that. So taking a look at the differences here, the white font is what is usually asked, high school, middle school, elementary, but the yellow is what they're gonna ask at university level. We wanna make sure they can answer the type of question in the yellow in K-12. Take a look, see the differences.
okay? We're getting closer and closer to what our definition will be. This is a reminder that you should take the time to form your own definition of literacy, of proficiency, of mastery, and I call it an elevator speech. You could say it by the time the elevator gets to the top floor in just two or three sentences. For mine, look where the yellow font is. So there are four parts for me. You can break it down to component pieces. Then you can explain it in alternative viewpoints cogently to other people. Then you can use it purposely, strategically to a greater advantage in a certain situation. And finally, you can critique other people as they do it. So you can do the mathematics, that's great. You can't critique others as they do the mathematics, you don't know the mathematics. These are four things, no matter what subject I teach, has to be in play. I might add other things, but this has served me well. Whether I'm teaching primary, elementary, middle, or high school grades, or collegiate level, I use the exact same definition, and it doesn't matter what sub subject it is at all. So let's just be mindful that you're evidentiary. The second general area to kind of get good at this is to develop that repertoire of very specific descriptive feedback techniques. So mix and match, read all those books on, hey, that would be a good descriptive feedback technique, and start creating your repertoire. And I'm gonna suggest you have a go-to 20 or 25. That seems to work with most of my colleagues and for me. Now, sure, right at the very beginning, we'll get three or four that we really like, and we'll use them a lot. Could you develop and eventually have 20 as your, your, your draw from menu? Yeah, you probably could. So try to, for 20 or 25 as you do it, let's take a look at some of the principles and some of these specific techniques. First, you might remember Ruth Butler's research in the 1980s. And you know some of it was even born in mastery learning with Benjamin Bloom. But in the 1980s, people kind of really got caught up in this. And what they're looking at and what she found was it scores by themselves. So this literally would just be percentages, rubric number, letter grade. You got 18 out of 21 possible, your percent is, that kind of thing, right? It turns out that it makes kids complacent, makes them unmotivated. To me, that's called harm. In the long term, I don't wanna make you complacent. I don't wanna make you indifferent to your own learning. I need to involve you in your learning. So I don't wanna do just that. Well, then people said, well, I also have teacher commentary. So score with comments, like B plus, very good. D minus or 1.0, this is a sorry hot mess. I'm calling your parents, come see me. Well, it turns out that invokes a sense of status and self-preservation. What do cornered animals do? Fight, lash out. They don't welcome the critical feedback and oh, look at me, I'm growing as a result. They're trying to conserve or preserve really their identity, their status. To me, this is harm. The moment you invoke ego, you undermine the instructional value. So when I give feedback, it has to be in such a way you do not get defensive and you're willing to think critically about what you're doing and then grow from that without be, your reputation being impugned. Now, the caveat I'll give you is this. Scores with comments, yeah, it has that effect. But scores with descriptive feedback comments tend to be good. In fact, Tom Gusky and Leanne Young and many others have research that says, absolutely, you can have comments with grades and it's a positive, but those comments are very specifically framed. I'm gonna give you specific examples of what I mean, what I mean there. So when I say, when, it, when Ruth Butler came out with her comments, those are much more the teacher just venting or the teacher celebrating and praising or something like that. That's not what we're talking about when we mean feedback. You'll see the examples coming up shortly. Now, down below, what we found is, or at least Ruth Butler's research found, and a lot of people were working off of this for, for a number of decades, and I still think it's very worthy to consider, is that comments by themselves had more impact. If I do comments, I notice this as a result of that. Is that what you intended and what's going on, which is one of the forms of descriptive feedback? People would think about it. They wouldn't be threatened. They'd be okay. But if I then said, so that's about a B plus. Ah, oh, there you go, invoking judgment and ego. And you kind of just shut learning down. You say learning is done. And I'm begging you, imploring you, could you move away from that? We are kind of conditioned to do all this wonderful feedback. And in the end, the child says, 
So, so what would that be on the scale? What they're seeking is that they're dependent on external validation to find value. Some kids, unfortunately, it's a mental illness. They only have value in relation to their test score, or at least they perceive that to the, their parents, to the other adults in their lives. And this is crazy bad. Uh, if I post something on social media as a middle school child or junior high child, well, then if I don't get 17 likes within five minutes, what's wrong with me? And I enter a, 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 a place of anxiety and panic to some degree. I wrote an article about that that's in the article section of my website, rickwarnley.com, if you'd like to get that. That's a problem. So what we're trying to do is have the student own his or her or their learning more than I'm the one that holds the monopoly as to how you're doing. In fact, I've actually often considered it this way. If a child says, how am I doing in here, in this class, it's a red alert to me, I've not done my job. My job is to help the kid figure out how he's doing in relation to learning targets, not have some adult have to tell him how he's doing it. So we'll see how that might happen during the course of these techniques. It's all started way back in my very first year of teaching. I was teaching language arts as a part of a middle school program. And I saw the title of this book from Marjorie Frank. If you're trying to teach kids how to write, you got to have this book. I thought it was funny, kind of clever. And one of the sentiments from that book was this one. And this is my paraphrasing of it. Marge Frank has become a friend now over the years. But, and she lets me, you know, share this. But this is the basic idea. If I only correct, you know, as I'm looking at your writing, and I keep circling all your spelling errors and correct them. If I keep correcting all your punctuation, what eventually happens is that students only use words they know how to spell and sentences they know how to punctuate. And you've just limited learning. Writing is this incredible tool to learn about physics, to learn about stretching in PE, to learn about coding. We write our way into understanding of something. Some of you know William Zinzer, and I highly recommend his 1988. I know that's ancient, but it still holds up his book, Writing to Learn. And I, I, I subscribe to that in that you can write your way into an understanding of anything. And I don't want to undermine that. So what I found out in that very first year of teaching, when I thought I was being teacherly, if I circle your mistakes, certainly you've learned from those mistakes. By golly, my job here is done. No, what it was doing, it was shutting down. So I found that judgment and evaluation inhibits learning. It doesn't advance learning. That was a big aha moment. And at, at that point I realized, oh, I'm about the kids learning it, not about me documenting it and pointing it out. You have done many errors. I have pointed out your errors and now you will get this grade and you will learn greatly. Yeah, that's kind of what I was full of myself with way back in the day when I first started teaching. So given all that, any of these have something in common? Let's take a look. All right, how about one or two of you just release the mute bar and let's hear what you have to say. That what do they all have in common? They're all forms of judgment. You got it, we got it. First one out was a, X, was a Y chromosome. Thank you for that. We have judgment. They're all forms of judgment. Now be very careful, look through it. It says stuff like, well done, doesn't it? Well organized, outstanding. This is a form of praise. We are part of humanity and everyone needs a cheerleader. It is okay to praise, go for it. Life is grand, but please don't confuse that with feedback. Feedback is something very, very different. I have to invite you in to your own learning. I have to add to your repertoire, your growth in some way. I have to help you think critically about the performance in relation to evaluative criteria. That doesn't happen with praise. Praise is just feel good, connection, camaraderie, we're in it together, no problem with that. Wait, would this be appropriate for any classroom teacher to say to a student in the class via online learning or back in the classroom? No. What this gets is what the great education philosopher Scooby-Doo would say, it gets a rut row, we don't wanna do this. Not cool. This just invokes ego, self-preservation. We can do better than that. 
So one of the great principles of this is you don't want to telegraph the solution. I got this from being trained as one of the instructional coaches of my school, the cognitive coaches. And one of the things we learn is it's not about me observing a teacher's lesson and saying, here's how you messed up and here's how you could fix it. My goal is not to telegraph solutions or even my opinion. My goal is to get you there so you will own it. I'm trying to create an active experience, not passive. So I'm not telegraphing things. So if I say, here's how you've done wrong, here's how you can fix all that stuff, nothing is internalized. They'll do just enough to get by, to get out from underneath the burden of this close scrutiny. They'll get very, very defensive. And I want them to be active participants. So be very careful. You're not saying you should, this could have been like this. Here, let me show you this. Let me show you that. That's not going to help them own it. And running through my mind is student self-efficacy. I'm empowered to actually be responsible for my learning and I have the tools to do it. So one of the coolest things you, I suggest you do is you realize you're a bottleneck if you're the only one that does feedback. I had to realize that early on. In my normal class, when I'm in the classroom, I'm out of the classroom now. But when I'm in the classroom, I have about 185 students. And I realized I wasn't getting feedback to kids because it was always funneling through me. So what I did is I realized students can give feedback to themselves. Classmate to classmate could do it. I can have parents give feedback. I can have professionals in the field give feedback to some of the student products to, to some degree from time to time. That really was just like a door opening to me. So I realized I have to overtly teach parents, overtly teach students descriptive feedback techniques like I'm sharing with you right now. Please feel free to use any of this stuff in that endeavor if you'd like. So here are some examples. Like I alluded to before, we're gonna to get to it shortly. Here they are. Notice what's in green. It is a pure statement of facts. If you are old enough to remember Dragnet and Jack Webb, you might remember this phrase, just the facts, ma'am. That means no tone, no conveying my emotion, whether I like it or not, no conveying solution. I'm just stating the facts. This happened, that happened, this happened, that happened. And then what's part two? As a result of that, here's the impact. So take a look at the first one. This is from a teacher giving feedback to a student. Here comes the second. Again, notice fact and then impact. We're trying to assess that. And I'm trying my best to get the child to come up with that or to at least let the child know how their decision affects the outcome. Here comes the third. Now see how I'm telling them what, I'm not saying it was a good way to set up your notebook or a bad way. Here comes the fourth. The fifth for PE. Notice here, I didn't say good run. I didn't say bad run or ah nuts. Or anything like that, I just said, what would you like to adjust? What'd you notice? I'm trying to get the child to arrive at and I facilitate that conversation. If I have to prompt with a few clues here and there, I might do that, but the goal is I've got to get the child to own it. Here comes the next one. And here I want the child to say, look, if I use thousands, people looking at my graph would have misinterpreted what happened this way. If I use 50s, they would have misinterpreted it this way. Using 500s, they get this understand, that's teacher gold. That's exactly what happens. And just by having to, to defend and articulate that, the kid will remember it longer. The goal is that the child owns it. If it's a passive experience, it doesn't get carried in the long term. And the testimony for a teacher's effectiveness is what kids carry forward in the long term. So now how about the child giving himself feedback, maybe in front of the teacher or just in a general learning log of some sort, 
let's take a look at some examples. Here's the first. Second. Third. Now for a younger child. Or again, what's the factual statement and then what was the impact of that decision? Here's for another younger child. So it doesn't matter what you teach, pre-K, kindergarten, preschool, kindergarten, transitional kindergarten, first grade one, all the way up to grade 12, it does not matter. The goal is the kids own their feedback, if at all possible. So kind of distilling these, these principles, look at what we're saying. And I guess that what I'm trying to get across is don't do CYA feedback, cover your beep. Susan Wu makes me censor some of those, you know, uh, naughtier words, but what are we talking about? We're talking about, I don't wanna have a teacher do this. Minus five points. You didn't have this. That's a teacher covering her rear end, trying to justify the grade. That's not feedback. Here's another example. Plus two, you did this or you had that. That's justifying a grade. That's not the feedback we're talking about. So what is the feedback we're talking about? Not CYA feedback. We're talking about, I need to increase the student's involvement in his own rubric, his own feedback, his own learning. That's huge. Taking a look there in the, in the box, I'm also trying to build the versatility, the repertoire of the child. Now, let's say you're trying to do that with me as a presenter of this topic. You might say things like, let's say it's a positive. Rick, you're using a lot of a real classroom examples. And as a result, I can actually envision using these techniques in my own subject, my own class. Now, that's a positive thing to say to me. And what it does is it adds to my repertoire. I realize, ah, using real classroom examples really helps. I'm gonna keep doing that. I'm gonna incorporate that into who I am as a presenter. What about a negative? Rick, you're speaking really fast sometimes. And as a result, I'm missing half of what you say and it's making me frustrated. My defensive walls aren't gonna go up. I'm gonna hear you say that and I go, oh, my goal is that you learn it, let me slow down. And I will do that. But in the first example, what if you just said, yeah, as a presenter, you're like a B plus or an A. That just massages my ego. That positive statement, when you said that, it doesn't add to my repertoire or anything. In the negative, in the second one, the negative one, I'm gonna get really defensive. You just say, Rick, as a presenter, you're like a D minus or like a 1.2 at the best. I'm gonna figure out some irrational way to rationalize, you don't know what you're talking about. If we were in the same room, I wouldn't maintain eye contact with you. I'd find a way to dismiss you and to convince myself I was okay because I am now in ego self-preservation. So if I want the child not to develop that, then I'm gonna talk about decisions not the quality of the work. Because when you talk about quality of work, it's a slippery slope into judgment and evaluation. So I might say this, I noticed you decided to do this and as a result, it was this. Is that what you wanted? Now, decisions aren't as threatening. They're not your essence, they're not permanent. Decisions can be changed. I make this decision, I get that. I make this decision, I get that. We're good. So I'm not gonna use feedback and grading and assessment, the whole enterprise to sort children or to just justify a score. I'm gonna get it, use a feedback in particular assessment to make them more involved into owning their learning, if that makes sense. But in particular, to actually broaden or create their repertoire of response to help them with their versatility in this. Does that make sense? Is that okay? So far, we're okay. Let's try one from a teacher's point of view. And maybe Susan, if people have some questions building, you wanna ask me one uh, real quickly. I do have a question time coming up later, but I'm willing to do some questions because I know this is, might be interesting right here, but for a teacher, you pause by my classroom and you just say, wow, that was really engaging. 
that's actually not very helpful. That's judgmental. And again, not very helpful. I'm not going to be affirmed. I'm not going to be validated. You, you just said that and you walked away down the hall. I'll say thank you. But what if you respected me? You honored me so much so as to be specific. This is a way of validating and affirming a colleague. So administrator to teacher or colleague to colleague, you're very specific. You point out what I did and then you point out exactly what the, what the impact was. Take a look at this example. Do you see an example how there was not an attribute? What does that mean? When you give attribute, like you say, that was good, that was well-reasoned, that was poorly organized, that's trying to be attributional in some way. You really shut down the acceptance of the feedback. Avoid that. Stop speaking about quality or the attribute and start really focusing on decisions. And what we found is when you're worried about kids developing tenacity, perseverance, stick to itiveness. When you talk about decisions, they're willing to engage longer than when you talk about the attributes of something, if that makes sense. Okay, is Susan, there a, come, coming Rex, up? Sorry, is there an issue with combining both of them? Like, could you not say you're in, your lesson was engaging because you incorporated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? I have found in my experience that if you start out with the attribute, the judgment, that's pretty much all they hear, no matter how civil and thoughtful and well-reasoned is the follow-up, they're still having this emotional response to buying into what you said or denying what you said. And so I have found it is a better use of, thought of your time and effectiveness not to do the attribute at all or to finish the feedback session and then separate a, a half a minute or more, tell a joke, whatever, and if you want to do the praise or whatever it might be that was really engaging, that's fine. But they will hear you more if they don't have that right in front of them to decide, well, how do I feel like that? How does that word make me feel? Because that's what they're thinking about more. Even adults do that from time to time. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. I'm going to push ahead. Mm -hmm. So okay. many of you know John Hattie meta-analyses. And one of the things they talked about was student self-assessment evaluation. Now, this one has been updated since 2012. I just took this from a blog. Arthur is a, a friend of mine who decided to go gradeless and just emphasize descriptive feedback the whole year. And it turned out to be great, turned out to work fine. But it's out now up to 1,600 meta-analyses, if you want to change that on the handout. But I, I decided to leave the original quote the way it was. And found out it's like number one. And in, in my experience, and when you read all the, the research that says, what are the factors that are most effective? It's probably the top three all the time. This idea of student self-monitoring. But Arthur is the one that got me mindful, as you see down below, with this idea that unfortunately, teachers control that. We control the monopoly on it. And so to what degree can I allow a child to actually monitor his own progress towards a goal is a huge part of their success in the classroom. And descriptive feedback techniques are a great way to do that. So you might know Bob Marzano's classroom instruct assessment of grading that worked. I almost said instruction that works. That's the first book. This is a wonderful book. This chart does not exist in the book. The data for the chart comes from that book. So don't go looking for the chart. I set this up for you so you can see it. But look in the left side, third one down from the top or third one up from the bottom. It's dead center. Notice what it says. Providing explanations why it's correct or why it's not correct. Even better if the student does that. Actually, if you look to the right, it's an increase of 20 percentile points and outside the school objective testing if that's one of the, the metrics or the yardsticks you might use. In other words, it's really, really effective as you do it. Now, there's a weird thing in here that a lot of teachers don't realize. Many teachers use descriptive feedback only when something went awry and they have to fix it. What am I saying? Half of descriptive feedback is literally explaining why things are correct. So I want a child to, even when it's totally wonderful and totally excellent, I will still do descriptive feedback. I will still say, how does your project match the evaluative criteria? I will ask all these guiding questions. If you only do it when things went wrong, students very quickly realize, ah, teacher code. 
teachers speak. Yeah, something went wrong. I got to fix it. And they're going to get impatient. They're just going to say, look, could you just tell me what's wrong and let me fix it and we can move on? They don't see the instructional value. So you have to be able to do both. So if a kid does a wonderful job, ask him to justify it. Why is it a wonderful job? What, what was so successful with, with this? And if they do something poorly or incomplete, it doesn't match, what would you need to do to close that gap? In fact, one of my absolute all-time favorite activities to kind of get into descriptive feedback every year, and you can use this if you haven't tried anything like it, is the child does something at home, which is gonna happen with all of them now, or they do it in the class, wherever it is, but you provide an exemplar, an example of excellence, and they have to write a letter to you. Hey, how does my, here's how mine matches the exemplar, here's how it differs, and here's what I need to do to close the gap, or if they think theirs is better, because some children have a certain bravado, braggadocio, mine's huge, mine's the best you've ever seen, they prove theirs is better, that's okay. Because either way, they're isolating critical attributes and they're comparing their work to a vouchative criteria for success, they're monitoring their own learning. I win as a teacher. So to provide the example on their desk or electronically, virtually, is gold when they have to do the analysis between the two. Just real co quick comment, look at that one right below. On the left side, it says asking students to continue. Do you see that? This is a, a statement that letting kids redo over and over and over again until they achieve the standard of excellence, you have a boost of 20 percentile points. So I'm going to make this premise for you. If you do descriptive feedback and all the wonderful instructional value, but there's no chance to go back and redo the thing for later on new assessment, you pretty much undermined everything. You don't you don't you want to teach in such a way as to engender hope not remove all hope. In fact, I'll put it to another way too. When I do summative assessments and I'm trying to give feedback on the summative version, I really don't do a whole lot of feedback unless I'm fully prepared to let the kid go back and redo that summative thing, that supposedly final exam, final project. Because if I give feedback on how to improve it, but I don't let you improve it, that's an exercise in frustration for what might have been. And I don't want to do that. And I kind of feel like you have a moral obligation to give it a go. If you have runway left, you know, you have school calendar left, and I could give you feedback, and it could improve your learning and understanding to a higher level, go for it. Let's do this thing together. You can actually get a higher level. So the thing I declared is the final version, I now turned a summative into a formative, and that's legit. So any questions so far, Susan? Oh, yes, we have three questions. One is from the YouTube live stream, and sure. they want to know how do they avoid using non judgmental language? Well, a lot of the examples that I gave you have a lot of that. And I think what you can do is comment, not, I mean, not comment, but ask questions about the decisions. That was the filter that allowed me to move more into that arena of not coming across as judgmental. Later on, I'm going to give you some of those sentence starters some of the stems, things like this. Tell me about this, okay? When you're at that point in your studies, what were you thinking? Or when you do that part of the presentation, what will you be thinking? Did that work for you? These, these are actually coming up. We have more examples coming up a little bit later about that. And what I suggest, out of the 20 or 30 I might share with you, memorize five and start working with those. It, it will give you that language to use and then ask students to do that. So I literally might print them off and say, here's the start as you're giving feedback to classmates or to me, the teacher, if you want to do that, that's okay. So no, that answer will come up more thoroughly. Okay. We also have a question from Wes, who was actually one of the ADLC facilitators. Yes. Hi, Wes. Uh, so Wes's question is that even if we create the best feedback, how, um, how can we make students read the feedback? Most students do not read past a grade. Right, so one of the things you wanna do is not provide the grade. Seriously, don't grade it if you're trying to get them to look at the feedback. I do that all the time. I've done that on tests. You'll see some examples coming up. I have a video plus some other examples. So I do all this stuff and I have the grade separate. I've, I've recorded the grade 
and the grade is revealed after a substantive interaction with the feedback. So one of the things I did in my own classroom for years, at high school and middle school level in particular, is the students had to record the feedback and have a response to that. We would go back and forth, almost like a dialogue journal. You can do that electronically, no problem, but there has to be some response to the feedback. We go back and forth and maybe they're working with classmates. They're really, they're not threatened by it, so they're willing to engage. It's interesting, when you were in college, you got a, you did a 15 page paper at university level and the, the professor sent it back and all it said was B plus, very good. You were a little upset because you spent like, I don't know, 90 minutes designing a metaphor between this sport and that political system or something like that. And you want the feedback. The feedback is, is motivating that you would want to engage on the stuff that I, blood, sweat, and tears spent time developing. The grade is not the motivating part. So I would say have a structured interaction regarding the feedback where the student has to respond to it before you reveal the grade. But if I give you the grade, what's going to happen? All you're going to do is rally around that. In fact, in the video you're about to see coming up, a teacher actually admits that. She used to do all this feedback stuff and put the grade at the top, and the kids wouldn't look at the feedback at all. They would just look at the grade and give up. So we'll show you some examples of that coming up. Well, good question, Wes. Okay, Christoph would like to know how effective is peer review? Um, in other words, are there steps that we have to do to prepare students so that they can be effective peer reviewers? Yeah, that's, I don't know what the law is in Canada, but in the United States, the Supreme Court has actually ruled that students aren't allowed to grade each other's papers and projects and tests. It's illegal to do that. And that's when it's a summative final judgment, but they're allowed to do peer review of formative things. And I'm hoping that will be similar to Canadian provinces, particularly there in Alberta. But yes, you have to set up norms, just like normal. So we would do fishbowl activities, or there might be a small group there in the center, rest of classes gather around observing what's working, what's not. And we would model how to conduct ourselves. We would talk about a sense of empathy. What if you somebody said this to you, what would it be like? We would bring in that active listening stuff from the 70s, 80s, and 90s that some of us still remember. Hopefully some of us have, have continued the peer mediation things. When I'm having, when I want to give critique to somebody, how do I frame that so it comes across as supportive and helpful as opposed to a burden or crushing or threatening? We would literally practice those things with something that wasn't urgent, that wasn't specifically about the child's grade. And then we start moving into smaller pieces of it as we move forward. But I think some of the techniques coming up will also, also give you some ideas about that as well. Okay, we have another question. How do you get students to buy into descriptive feedback when they have limited experience with this type of feedback? Well, remember a large part of buying in at all is what's in it for me. It's like the radio station, W-I-I-F-M. What's in it for me is the kind of the way I remember that. And so what are you getting out of this when you are the recipient? And what are you getting out of it when you're the someone that does the critiquing? It's an amazing process plus relationship when they do that. What I found is students actually are hungry for this sort of thing, unless it's threatening. And once they see through modeling, self-talk, think aloud, uh, and by the way, if you do a model of this, step to one side and let two of the children do it, the classmates. And if you're doing that online, literally have them talk, coach them ahead of time, a day ahead, say, I want you to talk like this. Here's a script you can follow. The kids, the rest of the class might know it's a scripted thing, that's okay. But when their peers say it, they'll hear it. They can say the same things we said and they will hear it. But I will do that over and over so they feel like it's a safe place. Kids actually are so hungry for this. It's not a hard sell because they realize, oh, it's helping me improve. And it comes from a place of hope. It comes from a place of the teacher as advocate, not adversary playing gotcha. And when I found that when kids realize, you will not let them humiliate themselves and you will not humiliate them that they'll move mountains for you. And that's kind of that motivation stuff. We haven't really had much of a chance to talk about, but I'd love to talk to you more about that if you'd like. Right. Patrick uh, Johnner made a good point. Ongoing dialogue between student and teacher about the descriptive feedback will increase motivation for engaging. And I agree. Yeah, I've, as an English teacher, um, I had very explicit conversations with my students about what is feedback and why is it important to our learning. 
Uh, we just also have a couple of questions that require some uh, clarification. Sure. Uh, so Jennifer earlier um, said, uh, can I take, uh, you said something to the effect of, can take a formative and turn it into summative and that's legit. Could you just repeat what the phrasing yeah. was? What, what I meant to say is, is, I think I said, I hope I said it, is you can turn a summative into a formative, which means a final project, final paper. This is final, there's no more beyond this, no more redos. You can declare, I'm now making it a formative assessment, which means I'm making it diagnostic, not evaluative. The only reason final exams, final papers, final projects can't be redone is because somebody sets the policy, not because it's pedagogically sound. That goes against everything we know. Everything is reiterative. Even high you know, certification exams for adults can be redone with relearning or a period of time in between. So the idea is I'm there to teach you. I think if you have calendar left, and some schools do this, they'll say, look, the grade is an F or a 1.0 or a zero or whatever it is, but you have two weeks and it's the end of the marking period. But if you go back and do the relearning and you resubmit the, re the, the new evidence of a higher level performance, I'll submit a grade change report form to do it, but I'm not gonna hide behind a master schedule design, an arbitrary timeline hoisted upon the next generation to limit your learning. And with remote learning, more and more schools are allowing that to happen, realizing that grades are a temporary indicator along a continuum and into the summer, wait for it, wait for it, into the next school year. Yes, yeah, schools have already started setting policies. If you demonstrate learning, from the previous year where it was so messed up with COVID-19, we'll go back and change the transcript from the previous year. Now it's a little awkward once kids have graduated from high school, I get that. So maybe make it K-11 grade levels if you like to do that. But the idea is that we teach to learn not to play gotcha by one calendar date. Does that help? Yes, I believe it does. I think uh, Thomas Gusky also refers to it as it's always going to be formative. It's only it's formative until students learn it. Then it's summative. Absolutely, a hundred percent. All right. Sue has a qu uh, question uh, that requires clarification. Rick stated that graphically representing student achievement has a twenty six percent result. What does that mean, please? Oh, I have a whole chapter on that in my book, Fair is Always Equal. I can send you the chapter if you like. But what we're finding is symbolic representation, which is percentage, letter grade, rubric, you know, just letters, numbers, actually is not as motivating. It doesn't, it, it, teachers and students don't invest as much as when you, you, you disaggregate the, the learner outcomes, right? And they get a separate bar graph, radio graph, like a pie chart. We also have landscapes, which really look like cityscapes, like skyscrapers versus tiny bungalows. Uh, but you can also have some things look like mosaics. And in today's generations, the idea to graphically represent data and knowledge is huge. It's very comfortable. My daughter just graduated in GIS, uh, Geographic Information Systems, remote sensing and all of that. And by graphically representing data, which is what you know grades are, just a report of distillation of salient aggregate data, separating it out, it turns out it's amazing. You see patterns you didn't see before. You really invest in changing the layout of the graph. So I can send you that. I wrote an article on it as well. It's in the list of articles on my website, but every single software program I found, a lot, really truly the online software for grading and grade books, student management record systems and student learning systems allows you to symbolically represent but also through bar graphs or pie charts, represent some, uh, graphically the student's performance. Maybe it's a line of growth over time. Wow, is that motivating and investing? Does that help? Mm -hmm. Do we have time for one more question? Well, we've got a lot more content, so it better be quick. Okay, um, so Joe says, I found that peer feedback is really rough on certain kids who struggle in school, even when grouped with students who struggle in the same areas or moments of assessment. Some students just don't want to share their work or to talk to others. Is there a way around that? I mean, yeah, I, every single student might have a different level of emotional comfort. And now that's social emotional learning to get them comfortable with that. 
I would suggest though, no matter what job they choose, they're gonna to have to get, get comfortable with feedback, giving and receiving feedback. Same thing with you if you have a successful family. You can have dysfunctional families, I get that. So now, do I then go study social emotional learning for how I make a child more comfortable receiving critique? Where right now he crumbles with that. And maybe I don't do that peer to peer at first. Maybe I do it with a trusted adult in his or her life. Maybe I do very small steps. You will see some non-invasive things that are fairly safe coming up in the next few examples. It might be just the child giving himself feedback until he is comfortable working with a peer to do that. That's okay, small steps, no big deal. But if it's something really extraordinary, I would have to investigate what was going on socially, emotionally, and then attend to that. But I'm not gonna give up on the peer-to-peer it, just because this other thing is there, I'll just wait for us to do the peer-to-peer until the other is resolved. Does that help, I hope? Yes, well, you've got a lot of content, so I guess we will uh, transition into the next Yes, part. My, my apologies. Let's just go ahead and push ahead if we can. So in summation, kind of leading up to this point, I'm saying sine quo non, without this, nothing. You can learn without grades, but you really can't learn without descriptive feedback. It's so fundamental. In fact, I should be able to circle in your lesson plans where there's descriptive feedback going to children, the best degree I can. So this is the basically the, the, what I shared with you before, but I want you to imagine I'm a stranger and I walk into your classroom and I interview every child. What are you supposed to be learning right now? Would every child be able to answer me? That's like a miracle in itself if they get it right. But the second question is, and where are you in relation to that? Now, Dylan William and many others have research on if kids know the learning target and where they are at any point in the journey, they hit the learning target way more often. That's lovely. And the example I gave to you earlier is listed here. The idea they compare their work to a given exemplar. That's an example of doing this. Then holding up a mirror outside of Snow White, I don't know of any mirror that judges us. Now we judge our own reflection in that mirror, I get it. But in general, in the classroom or remote instruction, while students are learning at home, we reflect back to kids what they did. And it's just the facts, ma'am, right? No telegraphing our opinion about it. You did this, you did this, you did this. As a result, this, is that what you wanted? But notice what it says in yellow, what I told you orally, all research articles will say, all books will say, there's no judgment. There's no evaluative component. That's not feedback. So that, that's something different. So if you're trying to be feedback minded, you try to control that part because our society is so much wanting to yield to the student says, yes, yeah, so how am I doing in here? Uh, no, you talk to me about it. It might get frustrating at first, but after a while the students get it and they're happy to do that. They're, they're fine. But at first they're so used to us spoon feeding where they are in their status. And that over-reliance and external validation can lead to some really uncomfortable, challenging emotional issues. And we don't wanna do that. So the idea is that it's formative feedback, feedback that comes in the formative assessment along the way, not just save for the very end after all the learning is done. So a lot of what I've been sharing is called Point and Describe. It comes from a book by uh, Jim Fay and David Funk called Teaching with Love and Logic. And that book was about classroom management. Well, I was presenting in Colorado one time with about 600 people in the room. And this gentleman came up when this slide was left up on the screen during a break. And he said, perhaps I should introduce myself. I'm David Funk. Oh, I'm so honored. I was so excited to meet him. He's like one of my education heroes. Wow. And then I said, oh, wait a minute. Is it okay I put this on a slide? He goes, no, no, I love it. We were talking about it with behavior and discipline but you're using it with academic feedback. I like it, may I borrow your slides? So in a way, I was vetted by the funk master, just saying. This is usually one of the first things that teachers do with students or themselves to get into descriptive feedback. Point out what they did and describe its impact, or I get the student to do that. The most common definition of descriptive feedback is what you see down below, three parts. What was the learning target, the learning goal, where is the child right now in relation to it? What are you gonna to do to close that gap? And what did I say moments ago? We have lots of research, anecdotal evidence as well, that when students can identify those two things, what's the goal, where am I right now? 
they're way more likely to hit that target. So then we give them the tools to actually traverse that, to walk that path. That's that second one. It's in every principles association definition I've ever seen. ASCD, almost all organizations use that definition. Now, a reminder, if you're about perseverance and tenacity, you will do this. Comment on decisions, not the quality of the work. We've already kind of made that case. Now, you should see a lot of dots. One of the coolest things I discovered decades ago was if I circle the words and write SP next to it, what is a misspelling, then it's passive, it's not active. And kids will thank me like, oh yeah, I don't know what I was thinking, but yeah, sure, I, I spelled it correctly. Thank you for catching it. Well, it happened when I would put a vertical line through a horizontal one because it should have been a positive four, not a negative four, and he forgot to check the signs when working with integers. It happened when I started correcting my students' labs, and I realized whoever is doing the editing is doing the majority of the learning. So when I edited their work, I learned a lot, but I'm the teacher. I already know it. My goal is the students learn it, and you know what? When I edited their work, they weren't vigilant and attentive when they submitted the next thing they make the same mistakes. They wouldn't own it. So here's what I found. I started putting a dot at the end of the line or some cartoon eyeballs at the end of the line or in the geographic region of the algorithm or the science lab write-up, or if I was teaching code, coding, the line of code, whatever it was, issue here is what the dot said, issue. Notice I did not identify what the issue was. I didn't write you know, on the margins in cursive or type it in, I didn't say it orally. And then I would model, self-talk, think aloud and have classmates do it as well. Hmm, how do I know what's wrong when I know there's an issue? Now, some students who really struggle, I might give a one word clue, usage, agreement, integers, maybe a term like rational numbers. I would totally do that at the most. And it turns out kids, when they correct their own mistakes, they own them. They don't make those mistakes again, and they're way more attentive and vigilant before they set the next thing to you. This is a life skill. This is a gift. We want to do that. So here's another angle on this. Those of you who remember your algebra or you teach it, which line has a mistake in it? I'll give you a moment. And just unmute yourself and shout it out. Line one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever one you want. You can just depress your space bar yeah, if you want to space your mic. Mm. In the this chat, we're getting line three. Yeah, it, it's line. line three. So let's just identify that. We're good. It's line three. Well, after a while doing the dot thing, which I use over and over. And by the way, some kids work, their projects, their writings could have way more dots. It'd be overwhelming. It looked like a centipede wallowed in an ink pad and did the cha-cha back and forth. So I went to my old friend, Pascal. Yeah, I'm that old. And Pascal said, if I had more time, I would have written less. And what I decided is one page of really good cogent writing is often more powerful and revelatory of what a kid knows than in three or four pages of lazy writing. So instead of 35 math problems, I probably would do seven or 10 but I would put these dots on there. And it was the editing of things and going back where they still continued to learn. I didn't need to do all this stuff. I realized that less is more. So just be mindful of that as you're going through it. Well, this is another variation on a theme, Paganini, as they might say. And what that means is this teacher takes the quizzes and the tests and does not write minus five plus two, whatever. She doesn't put the grade at the top. What she does, it just highlights where there's an issue. And the student then, the papers are handed back. And the student has to figure out what that issue is. It could be a tiny thing, like you didn't put the units of measure, or it could be a really legit, really profound thing that messes up everything. So this video is highlighting mistakes. It's an extremely popular video, a grading strategy. What I'm gonna do now is show you just a little bit of it. Now, Susan, please feel free to interrupt me if the sound isn't coming through, but I think we turned it on. Let me just double check. Yes, the computer sound is on. 
Let's watch Leah Alcala in a pre-algebra class. I'm Leah Alcala. I teach seventh and eighth grade math. Today you're going to see the way that I have started grading tests. <laughs> Okay, you guys, right now what we're going to do is get our tests back from Friday. Okay. Ah. Yeah. Being videotaped. I've no longer put grades on tests, and my feedback is all in the form of highlighted mistakes. When is the retake for this test? Friday. Friday, Friday after school. How do you find out your grade? Power school. You go on Power School tomorrow. It will be posted tomorrow. Here we go. For me, I really want every interaction I have with a kid to be a learning moment. What I was finding when I was handing back tests, the old way where I put a grade on it, is kids would look at their grade, decide whether they were good at math or not, and put the test away and never look at it again. I want you to look at this next one. By not putting a grade on the test, I feel like what I'm allowing them to do is kind of wrestle with the math that they produced for me first and think of the grade second. When I first did this, the number one question I would get every time I passed back a test is, what's my grade on this? How many points is this problem worth? And I had to do a lot of, remember, your grade in seventh grade isn't nearly as important as how much math you learn. So that took a lot of reframing for them. And at this point, very few kids will ask me their grade, and most of the questions that I get are about the math. I want to show you, before we get your test back, some of my favorite mistakes that came up a couple times. They could be from any of my classes. Negative four times two x minus three equals 28. I highlighted that two x equals seven. Tell your group what is wrong with this. I am highlighting where their mistake is, but I'm not mentioning specifically what that mistake is. If 2x equals 7, then wouldn't it be 7 minus 3, which is 4? Uh -huh. But then negative 4 times 4 is negative 16. Not, not 28. Beautiful. So it becomes part of the classwork of getting a test back to figure out why they made a mistake in this particular step. So I see that now when I give tests back, and they're continuing to learn. Why did I highlight that x, Pema? Because if x is 3 and then the fraction is equal 1. So what should they have written instead to talk to your group? It would have to be, have have to be 9 over 3. Uh, they forgot what they were covering up. They should have written um, x over 3 equals 3. Right. So I'm going to hand out your test. Can you guys look at your mistakes and see if you understand them? If you don't understand them, can you talk to your neighbor or me? How do I get negative four? How do I get that right? What'd you put? What was it? thinking, I'm thinking. When you add negative five, does it go this way or this way? Oh, negative three times five equals negative 15. Ah. So you really can't look at the number of highlights and determine your grade. It is a much more involved and nuanced process of understanding what types of mistakes this kid is making and how important are those mistakes in terms of learning math. What happened here? I just have to do this negative. Yeah, you just didn't finish. I almost put that one up. I really like that one. I grade the tests in two go round. I first read from top to bottom the whole test and I'm looking for the moment when the mistake gets made. So it's very important to me that I highlight only the mistake and then I explain to them that the answer they got was actually the wrong answer, but it wasn't at that point in the problem that they messed up. So I call it flow through credit. So these are two good examples of flow through credit. Here's one where they made a mistake early on in the problem, but then didn't make any other mistakes. So their mistake flowed through the problem perfectly. They only lost points for this. In this problem, they made a mistake. And then, even if I assumed this whole line to be correct, they got this wrong based on this. So they would lose points for both lines of this problem. So for the sake of time, I'm gonna push ahead, but it's worth watching the video 
And there it is on YouTube. If you want to do it, download it. It gets good conversation. And I show that video to grade one and two teachers, college professors. You can do it in every single subject. If you think your subject doesn't lend itself to it, it really probably does. And I'd love to help you brainstorm how to make that happen. But I want to give you some other techniques and get into how to minimize cheating and copying and that sort of thing. Another technique is extremely popular. If you just type in here's what, so what, now what, you will get content examples from all over the world, primarily though from North America. Here's what, just the facts, this, this, this. So what are the larger connections? So I, this is the difference between reptiles and amphibians. Great, this is the difference between these two premiers in this ministry in our province. Now what is usually like, okay, what are the next three things I'm gonna do in my lesson as I'm going forward? It's a great way to create the format for what we're doing with descriptive feedback. So I've often done this. Hey guys, we're gonna do here's what, so what, now what? And what I call is just here's so now, three words, here's so now. And then they add what as they do that. And the kids just put that on a piece of paper and that's how they're gonna do feedback to one another or themselves. And then I get to take a look at that. One of my favorite things to do of all time is an item analysis chart because I get to mediate relevance. So this is just a grade four class that was really struggling on whether or not they're careless or clueless. A lot of kids don't know when they don't know and they don't know when they do know. So all I was trying to do is there was a quiz and they take the quiz and I highlight or I might grade if you're still grading, that's fine. And they see the grade, that's fine. But then they get this chart empty. The student fills out the chart. If I do it, it's passive. I wanna make it active. And the student looks at every question in student-friendly language, right? Whatever the standards or learner outcomes are. Number one was dividing fractions. I got it wrong. I really don't get it. Number two is dividing fractions. I got it wrong. I really don't get it. Is there a pattern developing? Yeah. So they fill it out. Now, if you have younger students or students that just, it's uncomfortable to do this, you can use smiley faces, sad faces. You can use traffic light colors. They color it green, yellow, oh, sort of, I got it. And red, oh no, I don't have this at all. Whatever symbol system you want to use. Guys, you could have seven more columns if you want it. Like understands rational numbers or integer. It doesn't matter. Whatever you want, you put at the top of the column what you want kids to analyze. And it could be different for different kids. They fill this out. So what's on their desk at home or in the classroom? The quiz or the test, right? This chart that they filled out and a third thing, ready? They write a letter, dear, well, to me, it'd be dear Mr. Warmly. If they use my name in your class, it's weird. You should not let them do that. But there's three parts. I understand, this is the smiley faces. I need help in the sad faces or I need assistance in, but then the kicker. Here are four things I like to suggest I do to learn it properly. Now, they might have to choose from a menu of options that you provide, or maybe the class brainstorms. How do you learn something by yourself or with a buddy? And I will give you some suggestions on that if you like. I have never had a class fail to come up with at least 25 different ways. And quite often, it's up as many as 50 different ways to learn something, which is building their self-efficacy, their toolkit. It's actually pretty cool. They sign off on the letter. There's a place for me to sign off. I reserve the right to augment or revise if I think they need a little bit more, but they made the plan, they own it. They submit this letter with this itemized chart and the quiz of the test. We put together a plan. They're taking responsibility for their learning. It's a great way to do descriptive feedback and the kid monitors his own progress. Caution, if your examples are too perfect, you know, they compare their work to perfect examples, kids will give up. So don't be too perfect in what you're doing. You don't want them to give up. It's okay. And you know what? You can sacrifice your own ego for the advancement of your children. So they, like, oh, you're a terrible drawer. I know you made a mistake in the math. Yeah, I'm sure you can do better. That's all right. And then here's a weird idea. What some of the things we do, I keep saying, what's the goal and where are you in relation to the goal? But I'm going to suggest to you that we've had wildly successful consumer products great forms of music and dance and writing and all science and engineering when people did not have a specific goal in mind. They start exploring. And then kind of the, the corollary of this, they start out with a goal and they're allowed to change to another goal that interests them. They find more meaningful right in the middle of it. 
So if they're starting out writing an essay about this political idea, but maybe they decide it would be better shared as a debate, a competing podcast between the two historical figures, you might want to let go of your preconceived ideas and say, let's try that. It might be more meaningful to the kid. And so the question I offer us is, is it time to relinquish our sense of excellence, our compliance we expected, our imagination for what could be? The goal is that the previous, the, 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 the generations coming behind us should be superior to us, not just they get equal to us. Otherwise, civilization will stagnate. So be open to this as much as you can. Then we're a little bit short of time, so I'm going to skip that video. And I'm going to remind you of two last things, and then we're going to move over into the, the cheating, so on stuff. But we will pause for questions as well. Again, I mentioned instructional cognitive coaching, and I call that collectively reflective coaching. Some of those ideas just work so well. So studying the elements of what it takes to, co to coach a colleague, it turns out many of those skills apply to coaching kids with descriptive feedback. So one of the best powerhouses, the most practical ways I've ever learned to do descriptive feedback was to actually get trained as an instructional coach. And I'll give you some resources on that coming up. But these are some of the elements to which we're attentive. And as I promised, the elements are just there. It works very well. Starting here are some of those starting stems. That way you facilitate. And a reminder, you don't have to have the answer. So you can see something that's not so hot, but you don't necessarily know how or why. But you can ask the question so the child gets there. Well, how does this match? I noticed you blank. So as a result, blank. Was that your goal? That looks very familiar from what we talked about before. What have you tried so far? Can you get an example of that? Tell me more about. Wait, there's more. Did this work? How do you know? If you did it again, what would you change? There's lots of stuff. Well, in the longer session I do in reflective coaching, I've got about 35, 40 of these. And in all those books, you'll see more and more of these stems. Grab the ones that resonate with you that are natural and what you might do. And what I said before still holds. Memorize five of them. We use those for several weeks, then memorize five more. And then eventually you'll have a go-to 20 or 25 that really serve you well. And then use those over and over, get the kids to start using them, share the stuff with the kids, it works. These are the most practical books, this slide and the one that follows on getting some of those tips that work really well, descriptive feedback, which is a form of coaching the kid to his own discovery, his own learning. Down below, you will see three articles I've written to help teachers a little bit. One of them is reflective coaching, and that's how to take things you learn in reflective coaching or instructional coaching and apply them to doing descriptive feedback with kids. The last one of these little techniques is this one here. It's a classic. I used to think, but now I think. And what happens is when you say this out loud or students say it out loud, it gives license and permission for other people to grow as a result of new perspective as well. I used to think descriptive feedback was a luxury. It was an add-on only if I had time. And now I see it as absolutely vital. My lesson is not done. Instruction is not effective unless I'm doing it. And I used to think I only had one or two ways to do it. Now I realize I have this large repertoire from which to draw. So I would suggest after today, like as you're preparing you know, dinner or whatever you can do later this evening, do you think of five of these about today's topic or about all three sessions on grading and differentiation and then today's topics? Anybody want to try one right now? Something that's shifted for you in the last hour and a half or so about descriptive feedback? I used to think this, but now I think that. Anyone? Okay, well, if you want to post them in the chat room, we could take a look at those ourselves later. Just the last little comment, because I want to move to the cheating and so on. This is just a series of slides about redos and retakes and a reminder of what I said orally. If you do not allow redos for full credit, then the feedback was a little bit undermined and instructional power really drained or denied. So I'm begging you, yes, redos and retakes for full credit. And these, and I've done all of them in my career, very unethical and don't lead to the
teaching of responsibility and of course competence in the discipline that you were seeking. So stop doing these things listed on the left. And if you wanna peruse the slides about redos and retakes, and it's at the end of this where, oh, I didn't put it in here, I don't think, yeah. What I wanna remind you is that I have a chapter on redos and retakes that gives you kind of the mechanics and the why of that. I would be glad to send you if you just send me an email, no problem. Any questions or clarifications? Susan, you wanna drop in just a little bit before we start the cheating and, and copying section? Uh, no, no, there are just a number of people that are asking for permission for your slide deck. <laughs> so let me make sure we're clear on that. Everybody listen clearly. I will send you the PowerPoint version, not the PDF version. You know, that means you can't manipulate anything. I'll send you a PowerPoint version of the handout you currently have. I really can't send you all the colorful slides, but all these slides, you can add your own color, your own graphics, all you want. And then you can do turnaround training right back with your faculty. No worries. Kate, okay, thanks, Rick. And I ready to move on? Uh, Sorry, yes. can I be heard? Yes, you can. can. Perfect. This is Wes from ADLC again. Hey, Wes. Thank you once again. You bet. My only concern is all this great stuff and information. Seems like I need to grade things two or three times. If we're giving positive, awesome feedback, then I need to grade things two or three times. And what happens when teachers just do not have time to do this? All right. So you might make a choice. I will only do this with the four to eight uh, power standards of my curriculum. I'll do it with some of the secondary ones. I will do it with all my summative or my formative assessments, but not the summative. What I got into this and I wanted to have a life outside of school is I decided to do all the feedback stuff, but I would actually grade it at the same time. I just recorded it off that page or whatever it was. So then when it came time to coming back to doing this, I would have to, I would just put the grade in the grade book or add it to the, the test afterwards. When you're talking about redos and retakes, there are some really specific ways to save your sanity. So they're not redoing the entire test. Some sections can be banked, especially if you disaggregate and have the standards or learner outcomes written at the top. You can shorten some things in terms of evidence. Uh, you can only you know, redo summative things, not formative things. So the chapter might send, if you want me to, might suggest some more efficientizing, efficientizing of, of your practice and approach. But just because you can't think of how to do it mechanically, doesn't mean we should stop pushing for the principle for at least most of the things we do. And what I tell teachers is most means 51% of the time. School conspires against teaching. It's not set up to do what we know about how the brain best learns. Still we do as we do it most of the time, we can't do it all the time. And you're normal, you're highly accomplished professional, you're okay. But to not do redos or reiterations because it's gonna be overwhelming is really saying, I'm not gonna teach effectively. I'm not gonna teach well. And there are times when we don't choose that battle, but times when we really should fight for it, at least for the most indicative, powerful, most leveraging of standards or outcomes we teach. How's that for a non-answer? <laughs> Thank you. Would you suggest redos for something like an 80 or 90% though? Oh yeah, I do talk about that a lot in the, in the chapter. Any kid should be allowed to redo if they're not comfortable with the grade, but I might choose to fight that battle differently with different kids with different standards. Like this is just nice to know. It's not really germane. I might say, look, I don't have time. I'm not gonna do this, no redo. One of the things we've learned is when a school moves to a smaller rubric, if you're in the A range, it's called A. So in other words, if you're 90 to 100 is an A and the kid's saying, look, it's a 94.6. I gotta get like a 98 or higher, my dad will kill. I'm saying, no, look, you're an A. So most schools who get into this realize you can't parse out and determine mastery to that level of precision. So if you're in the A range, which is what, 95 to 100 or 90 to 100, we just write 100, get over it, you're an A. Stop chasing points, chase the learning. And then what it means is we migrate off the 100 point scale, which every single assessment grading expert in the world will say is inappropriate for measuring students against standards and learner outcomes. So we do the 100 point scale because the math is easy, not because it's pedagogically effective or correct way to do it. So we can talk a little bit more about that if you'd like, but yes, 
if a child doesn't like the grade and it's a grade below excellence, I, who am I to get in the way of a child wanting to achieve excellence? But for a kid who's getting mostly A's and B's or something, I may not choose to allow them to do something. Or if it's just a really esoteric, nice to know, I may say, we got to move on. We don't have time. Sorry. But for the big four to eight leveraging, I will fight for that and let, let that be wide open. I don't know if that helps, but that's kind of where I'm coming from right now. Let's go ahead and get into this, if that's okay, Susan. Of course. Okay, so why do students copy, cheat, and plagiarize and so on? So three parts to this. One is, why do students do it? Second, what's a constructive response? And third, how can we minimize cheating and copy and plagiarism from happening in the first place? Okay, so let's take a look at all those factors. First, a reminder. They usually cheat when they're not afraid or when they are afraid. I will tell you that in high school and middle school in particular, in my experience and talking to researchers about this, by the way, where am I drawing from? I did a ton of research with colleges, high schools and middle schools. It's mostly secondary, but boy, this still applies to primary grades. Don't worry. Is It's a panicked response. They're anxious. They're frightened. And that's a really powerful uh, motivator for some things. So I will just remind you that you want to start from that frame of work, not they're trying to be evil. They're, they never learn responsibility. I will also tell you that a lot of cheating happens with impulsivity control. Well, that's executive function, which is the last thing to develop. It's right behind the, the, the forehead. And that doesn't come online until 18 to 25 in most adults, sometimes later. So I have kids who have plenty of money in their pocket, but they shoplift a piece of candy or a soda real quickly for the thrill of it as an impulsive act. Uh, they, uh, grade sixes will walk down the, the hallway and just punch something really quick in the shoulder and it really hurts. And you're like, why did you do that? And they go, I don't know. And they really don't know. It was an impulsive act. So just be mindful of this. Now, why are some of kids cheating? Let's get real specific, analytical. Systemic pressures is one. This from Neil deGrasse Tyson. I'll let you read this rather than insult you by reading from a slide. This is really true. Are you valuing grades? Do you always talk about grades as opposed to talking about learning? I want kids to do this. I understand the spread of civilization through African trade routes in the African continent, but I don't understand the spread of civilization through the silk trade route with China. Do you see how they're rallying around the learning? I don't want them to do this. If I got four more problems right, I could have a B. No, that's not what we're about. Stop chasing the points. So we're going to speak in terms of mastery and learner outcomes, not grades and points, and then increasing high stakes politicization of provincial and state exams. That you get money, you get status, or whatever it is. We're going to grade schools, all of that. And we start doing class parties for certain test scores. This is really grotesque. It doesn't support what we know about how the brain learns. And then anxious parents who are operating from fear, not knowledge. In most cases, they overly assist. They're worried about the child and they don't realize how much damage that's doing. So I'm calling again, I mentioned this before, for overt training of mom and dad on how to do descriptive feedback and assist their kids. Other systemic pressures, increasing competition from fewer and fewer slots in whatever they're trying to achieve, sports, higher academic courses, it really is like, oh no, I got to cheat, which means I, I panic about this, too much anxiety, I don't have confidence in myself. And a lot of frequent normalizing of cheating in the media among politicians, mostly United States, not in Canada. But yes, national culture and finances, music people that cheat all over the place, systemic things, the kids are very influenced by it. But what about developmental factors? Well, exhaustion is huge. When you are really tired, your scruples falter, they lower. You literally don't have as many filters keeping you from doing things that you normally, if you had energy, would say no to doing. So they don't care as much about quality work. They're just getting the job done because they're in survival mode. Things are very, very challenging. Think about that. Are kids exhausted? Yeah. Most high school, middle school kids need eight to 11 hours, depending on the research study. That's really hard when school starts so early and they're staying up so late. There actually is a shift of melatonin release, which causes the secretion of chemicals in the human body to create sleepiness. Melatonin isn't the thing itself that makes us sleepy. It's what it causes 
production of in our bodies that makes us sleepy. Well, once kids sleep, they need these eight to nine, 10 hours. So if they don't go to sleep until midnight, because they're doing whatever, it will still run for eight, nine, 10 hours, if not 11 hours. So it's a call for schools to start later, if at all possible, to maximize instructional effectiveness and then limit to development executive function. I remind you, there's lots and lots of resources. We listed some earlier about how do you teach executive function and build those skills. But those are the skills of impulsivity control, meets deadlines, all those different things. And one of them is, hey, moral reasoning and what's going on. If you don't have executive function, you make morally corrupt or at least less than preferred decisions. We wanna build those decisions. Are you mindful of the consequences of your words and actions? It's huge in executive function. Continuing with developmental, the idea of panic, you're blindsided by a test, as it says. You're worried about others will discover you're not as proficient, that you're a fake, that you don't belong. Why should I give the world more ammunition? I'm worthy of rejection. When I think I'm a fake in this, I'll cheat. Again, these are developmentally very appropriate. Lack of personal confidence. I don't think I know how to do this. I can't say any better than the author. I'll just say it like the author said. Um, I've never, I've, math, I'm really stupid, so I'm just going to admit it and I have to cheat. Again, these are developmental. Now, the last slide of developmental is this one. I'm going to let you read the quote, but basically, some things are approved and some things are elevated, and kids can't discern between the two as they study. Go ahead and read the quote. This is from collegiate level looking at cheating. Now, I have to be honest, I look at that and realize I totally do that. I am reading a really good book and I see a word that I really like and I try it on for size. And suddenly I realized looking at the writing I did that week, because I write a lot of articles and things, I was using that word a heck of a lot. I was like so proud of myself. We do that. But I'm very aware I'm doing that. That's the adult level. I can perceive that. A lot of kids, they hear a word, they try it on. And not really sure, they thought it was their own genesis, their own originality of that. So I'm gonna remind you that, hey, that's actually part of the developmental nature of the kids we teach. Now, last little one, and this, well, actually there's, a, I guess I have a couple more here, on why they would cheat in the first place. A lot of kids don't have the note-taking skills. So we really didn't spend a lot of time talking about how do you cite the work of others? Now, interestingly, a lot, and I'm going to get to this next one too. Uh, lack of uh, proficiency in summarization techniques. Yeah, I'll stop there. Okay. And what that means also is paraphrasing. We as adults, I don't know what the figure is now. It might be 10 to 15 times the vocabulary sense that a middle or high school kid would have. So we see a lot of ways to play with sentence design and the words to use to say it differently. They don't have that versatility. So the idea that you build vocabulary for its own sake a dexterity, a versatility in finessing sentences and so on, that you do sentence play, you know, for a subordinate clause at the beginning or the end, because it was raining, I ran inside. I ran inside because it was raining. We just play with stuff. What are 10 different ways to say, he ate a piece of pizza, go. I want to build fluency with just sentence design and I want to teach words just to learn the words for their own sake, not necessarily just because they're part of the unit. And you know, Janet Allen's words, words, words is like go-to Bible for so many people. It's just words, 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 Janet Allen, and our follow-up inside words presents research of vocabulary acquisition and great practical techniques. Well, we want to make sure we get this fertilizer. for kids. Is somebody talking, Greg? Yeah. Whoa. Whoa. Oh, sorry. All right. So, and lack of proficiency in summarization techniques. They really don't know how to distill salience essence of something, they need to be overtly taught. What I found in middle school and high school and in college professors, they assume that students know how to summarize and they really don't. Yeah, I wrote a whole book on that. So I'm a little bit you know, biased towards that, but it's one of the top nine strategies Bob Marzano recommends from classroom instruction that works. And then this is really interesting. I'll let you read this about patch writing, which I think really does happen. Take a moment. Remember, this is college level, university level.
Now, this is the way a lot of authors started. They outright copied. Uh, Stephen King uh, is fond of saying it was Raymond Chandler. All of his stories in high school and college were Raymond Chandler stories. Just, you know, reformatted slightly. But then you outgrow your models. I try these models here and these models here, and you get a little bit better at it. As long as you're aware you're doing it, it's fine. But patch writing can be hard to identify, at least in the students at first. So now the constructive response. First, I want to remind you, what do most schools do when a child cheats? What's recorded? A zero, an F, no evidence of learning, no rights, freedoms, privileges granted thereof. To me, this is legitimate. It's OK. The question where you might cross an ethical, pedagogical, instructional line is whether or not it's recoverable. If you make it unrecoverable, you cross the line. You've said it's okay for a child to be incompetent. It's okay for a child to give up. You're not teaching the kid moral fiber, moral responsibility by saying it's an F and there's no hope for you to go back and recover from it. It's the recovery from the mistake that actually teaches. Seriously, and all we've learned about reiteration from mastery learning and Benjamin Bloom all the way up through today, we found it's not the label of failure that teaches, it's the recovery from it. I will jump in the pit you've dug for yourself and walk side by side with you as you recover from it. This is huge. So what does that mean? It means, well, the child will not be trusted. He's denied the trust we placed in him. He might have to do service to the school. He might have to write a letter of apology to his family, to the teacher, to his classmates, whatever it is. But the thing is, he gets to redo the entire thing from stage one, but now under my supervision or my designee. And he has to do it ethically. And what they understand very quickly is, man, I should do it ethically from now on because I'd have a happier, hassle-free life. So they go through and they do it. And they actually demonstrate proficiency. They do it legitimately. They should get full credit, not partial credit, because they were yielding to developmental delays or impulsivity control and all the other stuff that's going on in their lives. And with today's unbelievable stresses and anxieties and depressions, parents abusing children, all kinds of things going on at home. We're gonna be a little bit even more at using this and constructive in our response. And a professor said this, and I thought it was really pretty cogent. I'll give you a moment to read it. Again, this is talking about plagiarism at the university level. So what does that mean? Are you, is your response to plagiarism and cheating just a dire consequence? As opposed to actually teaching the kids how to avoid it in the first place and taking steps yourself so it's not likely to happen? I would hope so. It'd be one of, hey, I want you to grow up and mature and never do this ever again. Slapping an F on it just breeds the resentment and the lack of hope and even more panic. So study what we know of how to cultivate self-discipline, respect for deadlines, Honoring the adult who cares so deeply for you, entering the relationship where you don't want your reputation impugned, yes. And you will see none of it says give unrecoverable Fs as the way to teach it. This is just somebody who hasn't studied that stuff that we need to kind of pull back from it. So now let me give you some of those ideas. First, construct assessments that require very creative response. We talked a little bit about that before. I'll give you a few slides on that coming up. So the cheating is not easy to do because it's constructed response, not an easily looked up response. Second, do multiple assessments of the same content because it is hard to cheat across multiple platforms and multiple assessments in a variety of formats as much as you can. And the pattern, Statistics 101, larger sample size increases accuracy of the report. And you see some things where they might've been cheating before, but they can't get away with it in this format. And then, Please occasionally trust but verify if you need to, but have a synchronous assessment. So you're literally watching them demonstrate the skill or whatever it is if you need to. Now, as promised, this was from the differentiation one we did last time. So one of these is impossible to answer. These are complex ways to give prompts so the students don't wiggle out of it or just easily look it up online. And then a second slide. 
And these, this, this one slide is actually new from the last time. A lot of times people go, there's only one way to assess. And I'm like, no, dude, or do that. There's probably a dozen ways. And then I decided to give you also from last time, how can I raise or lower complexity of my prompts? So this is the tiering section with curriculum examples. And then the idea, I want you to be an active creator, not a passive consumer. So if our assessment prompts are merely an echo of what a website said, a book said, a film said, what I said, that's ripe for cheating and copying. So I need you to create something, to do something with the content, not merely just be a good parrot or an echo of the content. And a reminder from Sharon Bowman that all learning and assessment is an act of creation, not of consumption. Now, some of those other assessment format factors, I shorten the number of items so it's not just an endurance test where they're trying to get through it, but they're really trying to analyze, maybe critique others. Again, I can see what you know in one page of really good writing then in three or four pages of lazy writing. I'm also gonna create a bank of test questions. We do this in my school already where we exchange ideas and we say, can I see your test, can you see my test? We put them together. So if you need like five questions from here, then you can draw from that. If I need five, you need five questions, I can give you mine. And I was on a wonderful webinar last week with ADLC there in Alberta. And uh, Carla had mentioned this idea of you could do a mail merge with Google Docs so that every kid has a different set of questions. As you do that, it's randomly selected. It's awesome. Please watch that. I'll give you the way to hook into that in just a moment. So thank you, Carla, for that. And some kids might need to explain their thinking through Flipgrid. So it's kind of like when I do multiple choice questions, the next question is, and why did you make the choice you did? And you can't use process of elimination. Whoa, I see so many misconceptions coming to the forefront when I do that. This is the, the bullet that tells you how to get that. It's a webinar on May 8th. I hope that'll be available from uh, ADLC at some point as a recording people can look at. I wish they could look. There's speaking with good English. And then a reminder, instructional factors. I could teach it in a developmentally appropriate way. If I teach in a way that's not developmentally appropriate, the kids are going to survive, and usually it's going to be by taking shortcuts. So when I walk in and I say, prove to me you're, you're representing the cognitive science of this, I better be able to see that. I can also show kids the test ahead of time. Nothing is a secret. They know exactly how they're going to be tested. They won't be as panicked. There's hope. You come across as advocate, not adversary. So yes, I gave out a copy of the test questions. If I think you'll just memorize your, your responses, I'll change the raw data. You'll have different data for that chart. Um, if I say compare two pieces of poetry in terms of these three literary elements, I'll give you two different poems when we actually do the live test down the road. But the idea is you'll have the same exact question, no surprises. And then for long-term projects, the third bullet, they have to give me little pieces along the way so we can account for how they're developing. I'm extremely good at making the implicit explicit. No guessing on what the on the teacher's mind. You'll know exactly how to go from a two to a three, a three to a four. I will give you examples of different levels of performance, either from other years or I'll make them up so you can analyze them in light of the value to criteria that's going to be applied to you. And then I'm going to allow relearning. If the kids know they can do a redo, they're not as panicked, not as anxious. We already kind of talked about that. And then if you need to get to know your kids, so you can be development appropriate. I wrote an article that got a lot of play about a year and a half ago. There it is. If you want to get that, how do you get to know your kids? You can be responsive to them. And then direct instruction of ethics, literally overtly doing lessons on personal integrity, doing lessons on this idea that if you cheat, call it, you are lying because no kid wants to be called a liar. This comes from a college professor. You see the quote there. A lot of kids think everybody cheats is okay. But if you say cheating is a form of lying, they're like, <clears throat> they get more concerned about it. And of course, on the most important assessments, they have to sign an honor code, design what that is. I've not given nor received assistance on this particular thing with everything and mom and dad sign it as well. It really cuts down a lot of kids who might impulsively do it because they don't want to break the honor code. And then outline the, all the class rules on cheating, describe the consequences clearly. And the second one is really, uh, really intense. What we do is I give examples of work that where kids cheated. And if I don't have those examples, I kind of make them up. 
And we talk about the feelings as a teacher marking something and the reputation, you know, the blow to reputation, the electronic footprint that might be left behind. And then the tier verification of when you log in, I think is actually legit. So I get an assessment back. I will call and at randomly ask two or three questions on the phone or by Zoom or whatever it is to double check or an email. I'll say at this time, we'll be emailing you. I'll expect an answer within 30 seconds. Just to double check, it's that trust, but verify. I also think it's okay to work with kids on their anxiety and their panic disorders that might arise. I wrote a whole article on that, remember? You're welcome to grab that, the article is there. And then I did a webinar on how do you help kids motivate uh, and stay invested in things? So I gave the listing there. You can see it, the recording is available. And you might be wondering, how do I get kids to invest and care about their work? There's a lot of practical tips there but a few slides from it. When you are stressed out and feeling anxious, you lack a perception of control. So do you think kids are feeling stressed out and out of control with what's happening with COVID? Yes. So stress on and off is actually healthy, but distress, which is chronic stress, very toxic. Kids do not learn. This is all from that webinar. So what does it affect, this chronic stress, which kids are feeling? Look at all those things. Being in close contact with stressed people affects your stress levels. Impair self-control. Oh, impulsivity. I'm going to cheat. Hippocampus is smaller. And hippocampus is what helps us form long-term memory, at least send things into different places for long-term memory. And then dwelling on the stress, the, the modulating fear response with the stress. This is the amygdala. Everything comes in to the amygdala, which is emotional response centers. Look where the amygdala affects all those parts of the brain. So this is a huge thing. So I need to overtly discuss and help kids with the stress in their lives if I'm gonna limit their likelihood of cheating. And then one thing that we what got across in the webinar is that once it's been stressed, it could take 30 to 90 minutes to get back to a level of calm where they can make the right moral decision of what's going on. Be mindful of that. And also understand that if you have the 20% increase in stress, you have a 75% decrease in empathy. So I understand what, where you're coming from, what this is like, if I want kids to hear. So we have to really make sure, kind of the bottom line, that we're dealing with stress students are feeling because it greatly affects the motivation, the capacity to learn, but also to make ethical decisions. There's more from this coming up. Coaching parents, uh, what is appropriate assistance and what's not, that's that descriptive feedback stuff. And then real training in executive function and a reminder from last time, those are, those are some of the skills and these are some of the resources for that. And then experiencing the tools that teachers use to check for plagiarism. I've been doing this for a long time where I, we visit websites. The students are with me as we do that. I just share the screen and everything. I'm visiting websites of what it's like and what we go through to think about it. Some of you know, turn it in. That was mentioned in last week's webinar. I totally agree with that. It's a good example. But I learned this from last week. Thank you, Wes Landon, for this, that Google Docs has a draft back function via Chrome extension that allows the kids to, to look at their drafts and see how much has been borrowed from the original source. And there's also this thing in Google Docs called originality report. I don't know if I have this right, Wes, but where it gives the report of how much of this is original and how much of this is borrowed. And the teacher can run that same check as well. Just taking this tour, the students have a vision of what the teacher's thinking, and that personalization, that vision, keeps them from doing the plagiarizing, the copying, just cut and paste off the internet without remorse. And then Nick McCann has this really cool idea, and I just love it. He was also in the ADLC report, where he actually keeps a list, a repository of the sites kids would quickly go to to get answers. So he knows, he has that wording right there to look it up. I thought that was wonderful. And then also from Nick, he has a script protocol for conducting conversations when there is plagiarism. How do you sit down and accuse a child, mom and dad are in the room, of plagiarizing? What are the steps you go through? He has made that available. And I'm working with him. I just asked him and he, gave, he said, yes, he'd be interested in writing an article on this. So I'm hoping that that'll happen. But if you see the little URL there, the bit.ly URL there, you could actually get a copy of this and kind of work through those steps and how you work with the kid on, how do I hold him accountable, but make him recover from this so he matures in the process, he owns it, 
and he learns never to do it again. It's really quite nicely done. He's just a very thoughtful guy. I'd recommend Nick's work for this. Then do you co cultivate a positive teacher student relationship? Again, kids will move mountains for you. I've had kids do this. I never cheat for Mr. Warmly because it's Mr. Warmly. I don't want to disappoint him. I want to have his respect. I might do it for other teachers with whom I don't have a close relationship. That's cool. I will do that. But do you come across as having their back, keeping them from humiliating themselves, or do you come across as, hey, I'm going to play gotcha the whole time? Now, just some ideas about creating positive relationships from the webinar. I wanted to move to this. It turns out when kids have voice in their studies, they have a sense of control. We talked about that before. They're less likely to cheat. So these are some ideas. And then these are very specific ideas for subject areas. How do you help kids create the sense of choice? Here's another slide of possibilities. These would be awesome and it would help lower or diminish, minimize the amount of cheating they're likely to do. They might need more time and you're gonna grant them that time because you're about their learning. That might be okay to do, you have to choose that. Last thing I'll give you, and then I have one controversial statement I want to say, and then I'm going to get I'm going to get quiet. I wrote a book on summarization techniques. It's here if you want to get some ideas, and I'm going to make sure we're going to teach kids proper note taking. Here's the controversial idea. So if you weren't perky, get perky now. Ready? I think cheating is not the thing to sweat right now. It's actually not the bigger issue at hand. There are so many bigger things to get so much, like a, almost a teacher tantrum, a harsh scolding, and oh, you have an F forever. In the middle of COVID frantic emergency remote instruction, learning at home, you're missing the point of what's going on. It's not worth the shutting down. So the normal things we would do, like you have to stay after school, you're expelled, you get an F forever in the course, don't work, by the way, a lot of those didn't work at all in the first place. So I'm gonna suggest you might wanna do these more constructive responses, particularly now through the next year, because I don't think there's gonna be a lot of face-to-face -face next year as well. There might be a combination of face-to-face -face and online or mostly online at home learning. Might be take a step away from the cheating issue and really try to do it as necessary as you really need to, being informed with these insights but not make it the big bugaboo you might have made it before in the regular classroom. Questions and clarifications. I'll just tell you there are resources here at the very end if you'd like to go through that. But let's do questions right now. Susan? Um, so if anyone has a question right now, please type it in the chat box and we will address it. Um, I also wanted to mention that the ADLC session that took place last Friday, uh, we had some technical difficulties. So the ADLC team is currently in the process of uh, recapturing um, that video. And so we should have that link ready to go next week. So we can certainly send it out to the participants. Um, next week when we also provide um, the other resources from the session. Thank you for that. Okay, and so again, we have about six minutes left. So if anyone has a question, please do so in the chat box. Christine, can you check the live stream from YouTube? Are there any questions coming in from there? None at the moment, Susan. Okay, great, thanks. That's okay, now we said there was a link to the script program that they couldn't get it to work. So maybe we could check that too and get Nick McCann's script protocol out to people yeah. when they release the link itself for the recording, would that be okay? Yes, I've always, I've already made a to-do list of things okay. to send out. I, I tried that link just last night to double check and it worked for me, so double check. Maybe add a dot in there between bit and Lee. If you didn't have the dot in there, I don't know. Maybe that was a difference, but check it out. Okay. Okay, so I guess if we don't have any questions, uh, Rick, I am going to get you to stop sharing and I'm gonna share <laughs> my slide. 
no problem uh, Thank to, you. to talk about uh, the upcoming session for May 22nd. So as many of you know, oftentimes um, we have to be reflective in our learning. And so many of you who have joined us today have also been fortunate enough to have joined us for the day one and day two. And so we thought it would be good to have a session with Rick um, where it's just an open Q&A. So if you still have further questions and wonderings about any of the pieces you've learned in this assessment for supporting learning at home series, uh, please feel free to join us. I will add in the link to that session again. I did that earlier. So if you scroll back in the chat, I did provide the link to sign up for that. And again, it is also a free session from ADLC. I'm sorry, from ERLC. I apologize for interrupting, but that's so exciting that there's a chance to go, I don't even know what questions I have. You know, I've got all this information. I want to percolate a little bit. So May 22nd, come back with some of the more substantive questions. But if you want to email, it's okay. I'll be glad to answer emails too. Okay, great. Um, let's see here. We have um, also a survey that's connected to your registration. Um, so it would be a good idea before you register to think about what questions you might want to ask so that we can review those questions and try to kind of see what are the patterns of what um, questions people have um, to prepare for that session. And Christine just posted the link. So again, if you'd like to sign up right away or just get it ready, uh, you can also uh, address that through the link that Christine just posted. Okay, I don't think we have any further questions. Oh, uh, there is one from Tom. I'd love to hear Rick's ideas on how to increase student engagement through emergent distant learning, distance learning. Emergent distance learning? Supporting yeah. learning at home, yeah. Yeah, and I, I got to tell you, Tom, we do talk about that in the uh, COVID-19 motivations webinar that I listed earlier. So I would ask you to take a look at that stuff. And one of the things we found is increasing student voice and teacher relationship are great ways to get them to invest in that. But there are other things. Like one of the things we've learned is when you do remote instruction of some sort, it takes longer to get through the curriculum. So one of the things we do is say, whoa, take a step back and identify the really most important standards and then spend your attention on going deeper with those instead of trying to get everything done. Otherwise, you know, your panic to get through it will translate to the student's panic to get through it as well. But that webinar, and then I, if, if that's not enough for you, um, I will be glad to send you some other ideas on how do you engage kids from a distance away, but it's a little bit beyond what we can do in the final seconds here. But the webinar will give you some at least start, a starting run at it, if you like. Okay. I, also, I also tell you this real quickly. If students have the skills and they perceive they have the competencies, they're willing to engage in something that's a little bit beyond them. Motivation is not something we do to students. It comes from within. You can only be motivated to do the things you're already comfortable doing. So sometimes what I do to get you motivated, like at first you could care less about something, but if you get the skill set and you learn this, you're like, bring it on, man, I'm fine. Even teachers are like this. If I ask a teacher to teach something where they don't have a skill set to do it, they drag their feet, their heart is not in it. But if they perceive they already have the skills, they're way more likely to invest in it. So if I want you to summarize, I teach you overtly how to summarize really well and in a variety of ways. And now when I say summarize, you totally do it. It's not an imposition on you. It's not a, an overwhelming mountain to climb. So developing confidence to get motivated in it, it's kind of like learning stuff allows you to actually learn more. Some of you know that from the cognitive science world. It's the same thing in motivation. So I'll, I'll, I'll end with that. Okay, great, thanks. So if you have any further questions, you can email Rick on the email that's displayed on your screen, rick at rickwarmly on microsoft.com. And thank you again for joining us on behalf of ERLC and the Alberta Regional, Regional Consortia. I'm Susan Wu, and uh, we hope to see you on May 22nd for Q&A with Rick Warmly. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.